Good morning. Will you stand with us? Good morning to everybody here. Come on in from the foyer. We're going to start worshiping the Lord this morning. Welcome to those online this morning. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into Your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old man knew Jesus when I met you You called my name You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day in the test. Oh, Pass in the right. test. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> Love that. Sometimes you need a little help from your friends. How are you today? Good. Amen. You got the victory? 
All right, why don't you turn to somebody and say, we have victory in Jesus' name. Turn to them. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm Pastor Judy. It's always wonderful to be with you. We want to welcome those that are uh, watching online, that you'd be a part of our service. We know that there are different ones that are struggling with sickness. Still, that nasty COVID kind of shows up occasionally, and the flu bug. Well, whatever bugs you, we're going to come against it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to walk in that healing and in that victory. Well, our heart is pretty heavy this morning uh, for Jerusalem, for Israel, and uh, for our brothers and sisters in all those countries that are innocent, amen, that love Jesus and are caught in the, in the middle of this. I wanted to read some scripture this morning as I started in the Psalms, and uh, why don't you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? And if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, you want to carry around a sword these days, amen? And, uh, and if you turn to Psalms uh, 122, we're going to start there today. What I found as I was reading through the Psalms, that I started, you know, with 122, and I just kind of went right on through, not that I'm going to read all that uh, this morning, but just going right up into Psalm 130. And so we're going to start at 122 and verse 6. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure, Lord. May there be peace within their walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of Of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. And when it goes down into Psalm 123, I think of our nation too. And this would be a wonderful prayer for you guys to be praying uh, for our nation. And when I move down into Psalm 124, I think of Israel again and and turning that into a a prayer. And at the end of that, that last verse, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Last night as I began to um, fall into sleep, I kept thinking there is no one greater than our God in, in all the earth, in all the world, in all the universe. Nothing that's ever existed is greater than our God. And we need to remember that. And I hear how it rings through my spirit that God says people will know that his hand is upon Israel, that he doesn't slumber, he doesn't sleep, concerning those that he loves. He's keeping a watchful eye there. Nothing is taken, nothing that uh, to God is by surprise. He, he knows all that's coming. He knows how to deal with it. And in Psalm 125, verse 1, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Can you say amen to that? And just before I go into prayer, uh, the devotional today uh, for me, it just hit home, and I wanted to share that with you to encourage you. It says, let every strategy of hell be exposed. This is taken from Psalm 37, 12 through 15. Do not fear the strategies of hell that the enemy plans against you. For in the light of my righteousness, they will all be exposed. There will be no prospect of success for the evil man, and the lamp of the wicked will be put out. And though the evil one plots against my just servants and gnashes at them with his wicked teeth, I laugh at him. I laugh at him because his day is coming. And his own sword will pierce his wicked heart. And I break his arm from bringing destruction upon you. I will be your stronghold in the day of trouble. For I know those who place their trust in me. This is the time when if ever we needed 
to practice trusting our God, it is now. Amen? We can't lean on our own understanding, but we need to invite God into every situation. And when we do that, he has promised that he will direct our paths. Amen? And he will give wisdom. So this morning, would you please join with me as we pray for Israel today and those who are in harm's way? Father God, we come to you, Lord. And we acknowledge, oh God, in this battle, Lord, that I believe is in the heavenlies, we cannot fight them with our own logic or our own strength. And so we come to you, Lord, and we ask, Father God, that you would give wisdom to those who are making decisions for the safety of people today, Lord. We ask, Lord, that there would be a unity in decisions that are made so that your blessing would fall upon the orders that they give. Father, we've heard about uh, these drones and all these things that are, that are being headed toward Israel. We thank you, Lord, that we can call upon you. We can ask for heavenly hosts to just go into place and just snuff them out. They're, they're nothing. They're nothing in your sight, Lord. So just take them out, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, of course, we pray for peace, not only for Israel, but for our world and for our country. But we know, Lord, that without you, Jesus, there will be no peace. We also recognize that there is a, a spirit that is out to destroy all godly and moral people. That spirit of antichrist has been around since you walked the earth, Jesus. And we recognize that. But we also recognize the power that you have given us in your word, Jesus. And we take that power and authority this morning. And we come against this enemy. We come against this spirit of darkness. And all spirits of darkness that have been assigned to bring down your people, no matter what country, what nation, in Jesus' name. And so now, Lord, you said you would be a shield about those who love you. We ask God that you would supernaturally shield people in all of these countries, Lord, that you would protect them with the heavenly host in Jesus' name. Oh, God, how we need you. How we need you. I think about that little child after the, the worship team had finished their practice and they stepped away, and this little guy, about two years old, steps up and grabs the mic and said, Oh, we need you, God. Oh, we need you, God. And I thought, yes, let our voices be heard. We need you, God. May we not be silent any longer, but may we declare the works of our God and that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he is the Lord thy God most high. And if God's people agree with that, I want you to shout amen. amen. And um, so this, this next song, it's talking about Lazarus coming out of, out, out of the grave. He was dead. And as our, our pastor at our church says, he was dead, dead. He wasn't just kind of dead. He was dead, dead. And Jesus spoke and he came out. What kind of a revival did he have that day? And that's what we want for our souls, just to come alive with the love of Christ and to um, be so on fire that people around you want what you've got. We need to be revival in our communities. So let's sing this back to life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me. For I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind, hallelujah, 
you brought me back to life I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name out of the grip of darkness into the light of grace just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life And where there is dead religion Now there is living faith All of my hope and freedom I found in Jesus' name Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life no longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the great behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. When something says I to the price you paid when something says i'm not worthy i point to that empty grave just like lazarus oh you brought me back to life no longer i who live but christ in me you've done for me Jesus to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back to life oh you brought me back to life you brought generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb 
Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to the lamb and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the lamb oh we'll sing the song forever and amen and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever, hear your people sing. Your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries I think the angels turned their head on that one, yeah. don't you? <laughs> Susie and Maddie, thank you, but also thank you, Chris. Thank you for supporting those two lovely ladies in your life. Also, we're thankful for Chris had an accident where he was hit by a car on his lawnmower going across the street to do some mowing, and uh, he had a pretty serious accident. We're just so glad you're here. God bless you. 
aren't there just a great deal of wonderful people in the kingdom of God? Amen. Awesome. Just awesome. Well, we have a few announcements here this morning. Um, if I've got them. Okay, here we go. You know, I might just have to do it by memory. That's interesting. I normally have this all set. But I'm not one who does the announcements every... There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sherry's sick this morning. Our own Vanna White, I always call her. She does such a great job. In the foyer, we have two tables for two issues. Last day to sign up for the men's conference. And George will be, take your money and sign up. Got to be paid up by today. Otherwise, it goes up to 50 bucks by tomorrow. So we're going to send in our list of guys. So we're going to be going to the Warrior's Table. A ta a skill, excuse me. The Warrior's Tale, which is a, a conference. And it's going to be a great conference for men in Muskegon next Friday night and Saturday morning through the early afternoon. Also at the table is uh, a... Lucy from Rebecca Curran's uh, team, who is, she's from Resurrection Life in Granville. She is um, running for Senate. She got in the race a little late, and she needs some signatures. And if you'd like to help her out by giving her your signature, she is, um, uh, she is, how would I put this? The, her church says she's a good person. Her pastor says she's a good person, and that's good enough for me. And we, we had an opportunity to meet her at the Liberty Pastors of West Michigan. And um, so if you'd like to help her out, uh, give your signature so she can get on the ballot for the primary in uh, August. Don't forget to take a flyer at the coffee bar for Jordan Youngquist, who's running for 81st District. Jordan is one of our own, and we're always happy to support him. Uh, Tuesday, April 16th, 6 p.m., Refuge Youth Ministries has a surprise. Um, we have a group of kids in our Rockford area that saw the Jesus People Revolution movie. And they're so excited about seeing revolution in their generation. Five of those kids are coming to lead and worship on, on Tuesday night. And uh, they're also going to share their testimonies. And we also have our own Michelle Wilcom from another generation sharing hers. You won't believe that Michelle at one time was a punk rocker. So that's worth coming to hear just that right along. <laughs> also on Thursday, April 16th, women's Bible study in the morning from 9.30 to 11.30, multi-purpose room. Membership class is Thursday, April 25. Uh, from 7 to 8.30 in the multi-purpose room. Fired up class completion is a requirement, just to make sure you understand that. Uh, circle Thursday, May 23rd on your calendars. The Bear Man testimony in Triunity Christian School, sponsored by the Liberty Pastors of West Michigan. We're trying to invite pastors and churches to this event to let them know that that's our focus for Liberty Pastors. But we also need to get involved in the civil government because that brings the environment for the church to be free in what we do. So we encourage you to come, come out for that. Um, I think if you've got people that don't know Christ, that does not know Christ, or you have people that you're concerned about, bring them along because there's an anointing by Jim Van Steenhouse as he shares his story of how he was saved from the clutch of an 850-pound grizzly bear. That in itself is an amazing story. And Jim is, uh, is just a, a great guy and also a very, very good communicator. If you're here and, and you're new, we have new here in the back. Sign up and you can get all of our emails and our um, text messaging. And also, if you have any questions, go to our website, crossfirechurch.org, and you will be able to update yourself on everything we do around here. One of the greatest joys I have as a pastor is to have people share their testimony. This is the year of the open door. And we just went through um, revival last month, talked about the importance of it. This is the month we're going to focus on the open door of stewardship. Stewardship is probably one of the greatest ways we worship the Lord because we're giving something that represents our work and our time. I'm going to ask the Snyders to come up. Michelle 
And Scott Snyder, Scott is a deacon here in our church. Scott's the guy that runs around the top of this building and takes care of all those units we have. He is really a blessing. And let's just give them a big hand now. Do you want to, okay, well, you can just do that, okay. Do you want me to help you? Sir? I'm going to read from um, Malachi 3.8, and it says, uh, Should people cheat God? Uh, but you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me out of the tithes and offerings due to me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord, Almighty, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Keith and Pastor Judy, for letting us share our hearts and to encourage today. I promise I'm not going to read this word for word. It's just scribbles. Um, I do have to put my glasses. We believe in tithing, but we were okay with not tithing and giving what we wanted to give, never really being faithful. We were cheating God. About 12 years ago, we moved here to Grand Rapids, and we came from a believing, we came from a believing church, and we were tithing, but when we moved to Grand Rapids, it just seemed like everything was more expensive here. You know, the rent, our rent doubled. Our child care doubled. Food was more expensive over here. Gas was. But these were all excuses. And we allowed ourselves to start taking from our tithe to pay for some of these things. We were robbing Peter to pay Paul most of the time. But it was weighing on us. And we were trying to find a church how we were here. And we came to Crossfire and we started attending. And, you know, God was really ministering to us and one day Roger Townsley was giving a message before the offering and he was talking about um, Malachi cheating God and when Scott and I left we were so convicted in our spirits and we just said we don't know how to do this so we asked Roger Townsley for help and he says you know you need to be tithing we said well Roger we don't know how to get there we don't know how to tithe. And he says, well, start with an amount, be consistent, and then build on it. And that's what we started to do. We started to build. And uh, it wasn't easy. It was really hard. There were a lot of times that we had to go without. And there were, were a lot of times where, you know, we didn't know how we were going to make men's, our ends meet. And God provided all, all the time during that that time. Um, month to month, we started building to give. It took us about a year to get to the full tithe. But what took place is that blessings came out of nowhere. Um, I remember one time my mom and dad sending us a check for new tires. You know, they didn't have to do that. They were on a fixed income. Um, sales. You know, when you need things for your kids, they need shoes. It always seems like God had the perfect time. You know, buy one, get one. You know, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> he just helped us to stretch our money. And uh, little by little, we were almost to that point where we had started to pay the full tithe. We were like $100 and we were just, we're going to do it. <laughs> and what we did is we started paying online because it says to give God the first part of your income and we knew we got paid on Friday and on Sunday we had already spent half our check so we said we're, we're not gonna let the enemy trick us we started paying online and before I get out of bed every payday Friday Crossfire Church gets our tithe and we are 
so blessed in doing that because it feels good to be obedient. Amen. It feels good to know that God's got my back if something comes up. Um, 2019, both of our cars died within a month of each other. We had a friend who gave us their car during the week. She didn't need it. And she gave us her car to drive back and forth to work. We had Scott's brother who gave us a car to drive back and forth. We had wonderful members that help us get our cars fixed. And God just truly, truly blessed us. He, you cannot outgive God. And we, we didn't know how to, we didn't know how to do it, but God gave us provision. And he brought someone alongside of us. And that's what I love the most is, he says, I know the plans for you. They're good. They're not to give you disaster, but to give you a future and a hope. And that's what God did when he was teaching us. Um, in 2019, I call it the year of trust. <laughs> Circumstances led us to have to move suddenly because our in-laws wanted their home back, and we had to find a home. Scott and I didn't know how we were going to do that. Although we were tithing, our credit still wasn't the best. You know, we were working on it. But it was just a miraculous thing. Scott's employer came in and paid off a whole slew of medical bills for us. Um, my employer, my employer let me use my 401k money because we were purchasing our first home. All this time Scott and I have been married, we've never owned our own home. And so it was just blessing after blessing. It was, um, it's just amazing to see how God orchestrated all of it. All right before COVID, you know, we landed in our house in October of 2019 and COVID came in March, and Scott job letting go, they laid all their people off. But we still tithed. We didn't let that prevent us from tithing. We still tithe on everything that we received. And that's when the year of 2021 came in, and we were blessed. God just pour out blessing after blessing after blessing into our lives. Because if you are faithful, he is faithful. And I got a new job. I, I don't even know how this offer, or how this job even came to me. I, I don't know, but God knows. He brought it about. I got a $20,000 increase by accepting this new job. I get to work from home three days a week, and I continue to get bonus after bonus after bonus from this company for doing what they pay me to do. You know, I love that. <laughs> and then Scott, Right after I got that job, you got a job, and they increased his, his salary by $16,000 a year. So in that brief span of time, we got almost $36,000 increase in our income. Don't tell me that God won't honor your tithes. He wants you to be obedient first, consistent, and then leave it to him. You know, it was embarrassing, yes, having people pick me up, bring me to church, asking people if we could borrow their cars. But you know, if you humble yourself under the Lord, Amen. he can do all things. Not just some things, but all things. And today, God blessed us. Well, not today, but recently God blessed us with a new car. And we have our old car. And we have just been blessed and blessed and blessed. And I wrote something that I wanted to remember to say. <laughs> Sorry. We just want to encourage you. We're not here to condemn you. That's, that's the number one thing. We want you to know that there's hope. If you are struggling on getting to paying your tithes, ask God. Ask God how to do it. But be consistent. Bring the full tithe to God and let him be your provider. And he will open the windows of heaven for you. And we just want to share this last verse. Okay, Mark 12, uh, 42. The poor widow came and dropped in two pennies. He called his disciples to him and said, I assure you this poor widow has given more than all others have given. They have given a tiny part of their surplus, more than they have. 
But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. And basically, it's really, you just got to reach out in faith. It's a faith. It's a faith thing. Faith. Thank you, Pastor. Huh? I could probably just say amen. They've already preached my message. <laughs> Isn't it exciting to hear testimony of what God can do when we, when we just simply obey what he calls us to do? Yes. <clears throat> I had a, years ago when I was a younger pastor, I had this guy who owned, he was the president of a bakery. I had just come to this church in Marquette and I didn't really know him that well. But he was on the board and, and I said, would you receive the offering this morning? And here's how we started the offering. Money's a dirty thing, but someone's got to do it. And I said, you're never going to receive an offering again around here. <laughs> Money is an act of worship. It's a joy because it's giving our first fruits to God. This morning, I, I want to talk to you about biblical stewardship and I want you to really pay attention, and if you really uh, want to understand this, go back online and listen to the message again. Um, a lot of times we, we see people begging God for money. We don't, God doesn't need your money, but he wants to bless you, and he has a program for that to happen. Today, keep in mind, I'm not proclaiming the truth about tithing because God does, he doesn't need your money. He already owns everything. How do I know that? Psalms 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So you have no ownership. You are just stewards or managers of what he has given you. I'm delivering these truths this morning for your sake. God doesn't need you to give. You need to be blessed. God doesn't need you to give. You need to be blessed. And I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here this morning. Turn with me to Exodus 13, starting with verse 3. <clears throat> then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you, come out of, you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today is the month of Aviv. You are leaving when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Armorites, Hivites, Debuites, and Termites. No, that's not Termites. <laughs> the land he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. <clears throat> For seven days eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days, nothing with yeast in it to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders." Verse 8, on that day, tell your son. That's a very important part. Tell your son. I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. After the Lord brings you into this land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised on oath to you and your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock, livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. We'll get to that in a minute. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. I used to always hear old pastor say when I was a kid, he said, if you don't hear anything I say, listen to what the word of God says, okay? Chapter 6, verse 19. These are commands. They're not suggestions, okay? Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not bring in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. 
But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either they will hate the one or love the other. Or you will be devoted to the one and despised by the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We've passed out some um, sheets to you. How many did not get a sheet? There's two sheets, eight and a half by 11. Uh, ushers, make sure you, all those with their hands up. We have two um, handouts. One are scriptures on tithing in the, in the Bible. This is for you to go through. You need to understand this is a biblical concept principle we are talking about today. The other is a, their confessions or declarations about when we do what God says, we can be assured that he will take care of us. So make sure you put them in your Bible, read them over and over this week, make them part of your declarations, and you will watch God begin to give you tremendous blessings in these areas. God didn't want the church to be poor. He wants the church to be blessed so that others will notice his blessing when we follow him. And that's very important, but he also wants us to be generous and not selfish. What does a life filled with blessing look like? What does a life filled with blessing look like? Being blessed means having supernatural power working for you. Being blessed means that you have supernatural power working for you. By contrast, curse means having supernatural power working against you. A blessed person may or may not be wealthy by the world's standards, but enjoys a quality of life that most billionaires would want. Can you do me a favor? Can you smile? <laughs> We're talking about something that's really good here this morning. At four separate points in the book of Deuteronomy, God tells those who will obey him that he will bless everything that they put their hands to. Now, when God says something, he's not a liar. He's telling you the truth. That's why I had these folks share their testimony, because I know your journey. And now she speaks with conviction because she's, she's, she's done what she needed to do. She believed what she needed to do, and God is blessing. And God will do things for all of us, maybe in different ways, but he will bless us if we're looking for those blessings. If you have a victim mentality, oh, life is just gives me lemons, and I'm always the victim, you will be a victim. But we didn't have you, you, God didn't have you come to him so that you could stay the same. He wants to change you this morning so that you can know that he is a good God, and he takes care of those who follow him. Four times he talks about blessing. In chapter 14 of Exodus, uh, verse 29, or excuse me, in Deuteronomy 14, verse 29. Deuteronomy 15, verse 10. Deuteronomy 23, verse 20. Deuteronomy 28 is a great chapter. Make sure you read it, underline it. But in verse 8 it says, The Lord will bring blessings on your barns and all that you put your hands to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. Of course, they were agriculturalists at that time, so they had livestock and they had crops. He said, I will bring blessings if you put me first. Because remember, it's God who grows things. I have a farmer friend, and he has more faith than me ever, that I ever could have. Because every year he puts millions of dollars into the ground, and he's praying that God brings the rain, and it, and it begins to grow, and he has a harvest, and he also is able to store it, and he's able to sell it at a decent profit. In verse 12, it says, the Lord will bring rain to be able to water the earth and so that we can have a harvest. And he tells him that I want to bless you, but you have to trust me. Yeah. Tithing and giving are all about being blessed. Tithing and giving means God must be first. Remember what Michelle said? She does it right away. She gets the check. My son... Uh, one of our sons, he's a contractor, and uh, he gets paid some big checks sometimes, and the first thing he does, he doesn't wait for Sunday. He goes right to the church, gives his tithe. Why? Because he wants God to be blessed, 
And he has worked himself out of a situation from 2008 where right now he's got his house paid for. He's now building another house in the UP for his future and he's paying cash for that as well. Why? Because he knows and understands the principles of tithing and giving. There are more than 500 verses in the Bible where it talks about prayer and nearly 500 verses concerning faith. But there are 2,000 verses on the subject of money and possession. So if there's 2,000 verses, that means it's pretty important. Jesus talked about 16 out of 38 parables about money. Why? Because money represents something for all of us. Clearly, from the Bible standpoint, we need to understand money and how to handle it. I like what um, one of the pastors, Creflo Dollar, says. It's so funny. He says, uh, as soon as we get into tithing, we talk about offerings in the church. Is oh, it's all about money and everything. He says, well, tell that to the grocery store when you get up there and you're going to pay for your groceries. And he said, well, you, this is going to be $105. Well, it's all about money. They're going to say, well, bring your food back because you're not going through this line if you're not going to pay for your food. You see, it's all about responsibility and recognizing this is just a part of life. Because money is actually um, a test from God. That's what it is. You know what testing is? It's to make sure that product is strong enough and right before it goes to market. Testing by God is saying, I want you to see what's in your heart so that I can change you and I can help you to be able to look at this in a proper way. How we handle money reveals volumes about your priorities, your loyalties, and affections. In fact, it directly dictates many of the blessings you will or won't experience in life. The principle of first fruits, firstborn, and the tithe are essential for us to understand and practice. In Exodus 13, 2 that we read, he said, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both the man and beast, it is mine. Your house is in your house. It's God's house. Do you use it for God's house ever? Do you ever have anybody over? And do you show hospitality? I know this couple does. Keith and Jill have had a small group in their home for 10, 12 years. And sometimes it's 30 and 40 people. They share their home because they recognize that their home is a gift from God, but it's to be used not only for themselves and their family, but to be opened up for hospital uh, purposes for other people. By the way, when you invite people in your home, they get a chance to see who you really are. Well, that one went over big. <clears throat> the firstborn is declared 16 times in Scripture. In verses 12 and 13 of chapter 13 of Exodus, the firstborn was to be either sacrificed or redeemed. The firstborn were either to be sacrificed or redeemed. There was no third option. That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from the animal which you have, the male shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn... Of a donkey, you shall redeem with the lamb, or it's, you have to break its neck. And all of the firstborn of man among the sons, you shall redeem. Now, why do they say a donkey had to break its neck? A donkey was an unclean animal, so you had to have a lamb to be able to be offered that was completely clean. It was called a clean animal. But if you didn't have that, you had to break the donkey's neck because it was God's. It was not yours. Seems a little brutal, but that's what they did in, in the Old Testament. You see, the principle of the firstborn is so important. Every time one of your livestock animals delivered its firstborn, it was to be sacrificed, or if it was designated unclean, it had to be redeemed by a clean, spotless lamb. To summarize, to the clean firstborn had to be sacrificed and the unclean firstborn had to be redeemed. Now let me explain this in the New Testament. John 1.29. John 1.29, um, John the Baptist sees Jesus for the first time. He says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. 
Jesus was God's firstborn. He was clean, he was perfect, he was unblemished. Every one of us was born unclean. We're born with a sin nature. The Bible says that we were born sinners with a fully active sinful nature. Jesus was sacrificed to redeem us. Are you catching that picture? Yeah. To redeem us. We were unclean, but he was a perfect lamb. But there's no more sacrifice ever again because he was once and for all, he said, it is finished. Romans 5, 8 says, Christ died for us while we were still sinners before we believed he died for us, believing that the generations to come would accept that sacrifice that he made. We give our tithes and offerings in much the same way. Before we see the blessings of God, we give in faith. We give in faith saying, Lord, I trust you that when you say put me first, you will take care of me. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith, not by sight. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is believing that what you say, God, comes true, and when I obey it, you will protect me and you'll watch over me. The firstborn in Egypt died. Israel's firstborn were spared. Why? The blood on the doorpost redeemed the firstborn of Israel. All firstborn were sinful, but the blood redeemed the firstborn of Israel. And if you look at what happened, they put the blood on the doorpost. Remember, the, the death angel was not able to kill the firstborn of Egypt, or rather of, of Israel. Why? Because they put blood on the left, the right, and then on top, and the blood would drip down. What is it the form of? Left, right, top, and the blood drips down. It's a cross. You see the cross right through the Old Testament. And that's why Jesus is the fulfillment of it. The blood on the doorpost was in the form of a cross. When we give to God, we don't lose because God redeems it for us. He brings value to our lives and he takes care of us. But what we withhold from God, we lose it anyway. In Matthew 16, 25, it says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will find it. That's what faith's all about. It's God, you're, I'll follow you, and when you sh tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. Otherwise, it's disobedience, and the blessing stops in that area. You might have blessing in one, some areas because you're obedient, but wherever you're disobedient in those areas, the blessing stops. The first belongs to God. Now think about it. Your time, the first of your time belongs to God. Why do we worship on Sundays? Because Sunday is the first day of the week, not Monday. And we give our time, our first fruits to worship. That's why Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 22 to 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Because it's reminding you of who you are and who you serve. And that there's a God in heaven who takes care of us. Also, we bring the first of our finances. Because... We want to make sure that the other 90% is blessed. We bring the first of our talents. Some of you are amazing using your talents to bless others, whether it be in the church or outside the church. Some of you are considering what you need to do. What, what I would say to you is get involved in some way, somewhere, and make sure that you find what God has called you to do and do it and be faithful when you do it. Aren't you glad for these ladies that are faithful in their singing? Aren't you glad for our worship team that's faithful, come and practice every Tuesday, and they come to bless us? These things happen because of faithfulness and using your gifts and talents. Are you faithful with your devotions? Do you give the first of your day to the Lord, or do you give them leftovers? Why do we stress devotion so much, Bible reading and having a plan and prayer time at the beginning of the day or which is best, whatever time is best for you, it's because it sets the course of the day. You will never ever see me at the office or I won't tell you I'm here 
in the mornings. I said this 14 years ago and I've been very consistent. My time is at home where I'm spending time with a Bible reading uh, program, memory program, a prayer program, and other, and study because I need to do that in order to have the proper focus. Because sometimes I can get unfocused. Do you? Do some people bug you sometimes? Does me. Maybe some of you have. Some of, I might have bugged you sometime. We need to get God's perspective on, on this so that we don't let our feelings begin to control us. But we see it through the eyes of heaven. And when I get done praying, I love all of you. Some of you more than others. <laughs> It always requires faith to give the first. It means giving to God before you see if you're going to have enough. It means giving to God before you see if you're going to have enough. By tithing, it is as if we are saying to God, I recognize you first. I'm putting you first in my life and I trust you to take care of the rest of the things in my life. It's really an act of faith. Every time you put that check in or you put, give online or whatever, however you give, it's an act of faith. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. What does Matthew 6, 33 say? It says, seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added unto you. He knows what you need. Tithing is important because it's a primary way we acknowledge God as being first in our life. But what about first fruits? They belong to God too. In Exodus 23, 19, the first of your first fruits of your land, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. That's what Exodus 23, 19 says. Where does the first fruits go? To the house of the Lord. What's the house of the Lord today? Church. What? Church. Say that loud. Church. Okay, now, let me meddle a little bit. Do you have the right to bring your tithe any place you want? What does the scripture say? Well, in Malachi, it says storehouse. That's the same thing. We are not to manipulate your tithe. That's the Lord's. We bring it to the house of God. Now, if you, that's a new concept. That's a biblical concept. Now, if you want to give beyond that to something, that's okay. That's called an offering. But your tithe belongs to the family that God has called you to so we can do a work together and do something greater than we could by ourselves. Some of you are chewing on that for the first time. But what would happen? That's the Lord's. The tithe is the Lord's. It's not yours. My wife and I, when we give our tithe, it, it's not ours. It's God's. And when we give it to God, then he begins to honor us with the rest of our income. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, We honor the Lord with our possessions or wealth and with the first fruits of our increase. We honor him every time we tithe and obey that we honor the Lord and we're, we're a candidate for blessing. Now I want you to think about when Jericho and I in the Old Testament, remember the Israelites went into the land of Canaan? Moses is dead. Joshua is the head now of Israel. The first place they went was where? It was Jericho. And there was a fabulous miracle that God gave them. But what did God tell them to do? He said, don't take anything in that, in that city. Don't take any of the gold or silver because that's mine, not yours. Why did he say that? Because it was the first city that they conquered. Now, who took some, who, who took some gold and silver and didn't tell them? His name was Achan. Achan hid it in his tent, and then when they went against the second city, which was a smaller city, they should have destroyed it easily. They had a lot of casualties, and they actually lost the first battle. And then it caused the leadership, Joshua, to go to prayer, and he said, there's sin in the camp. And that way, they, they searched each tent, and in Achan's tent, they found gold and silver and other things. And what was the consequences of that? Achan and his family were all killed because they brought reproach on Israel. And whenever we have people that disobey in certain, area, certain things like tithing, it affects other people. 
It affects the church's ability to do things that they, could, they, they, they couldn't do. They just can't do without the people responding in a positive way to tithing and giving. Jericho fell and Israel was told not to keep any of the spoil because it belonged to the Lord. Disobedience brought a curse and consequences. That's what he says in the scripture that when we don't do this, that there's a curse on our lives. There's a curse on our finances. Malachi 3, 6 to 12 that um, Scott read, verse 6 says, I, the Lord, don't change. I've always been this way, and I always will be this way. The tithe belongs to him. That's what verses 8 and 9 says in chapter 3 of Malachi. The tithe, the firstborn, and the first fruits all belong to the Lord. This isn't a law. It is an unchanging principle established by an unchanging God. Now, I'm going to give you a little argument that I get from time to time. We are not under the law, but we're under grace. You ever heard that? Okay. There are many things that are under the law that continue to be a principle of God. For example, under the law, it says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Is adultery pertinent today to the Christian life? Because I'm under grace, I can go out and commit adultery? No. Uh, can I go out and lie and steal? No, that's still just as pertinent as it was in the Old Testament. Grace doesn't discontinue the basic principles of the Old Testament. They just help you to live it. Help you to live it. There are eternal principles throughout the Word of God, and tithing is clearly one of them. It's a principle that runs from Genesis to Revelations. The tithe belongs to God, the firstborn belong to God, and the first fruits belong to God. Without exception, tithers say, I'm blessed, or God has blessed me, like these folks said. In contrast, every non tither I have ever spoken to gives me this response I can't afford to. And if you're if you have that kind of response, I want to challenge you to say, God, if this is what your word says, then I'm going to obey it, and I'm going to be a candidate for blessing. And you know what happens? The church is blessed. They can do more, and they can be more effective in what they do because of the obedience of its people. In Genesis 4, 3 to 5, Cain and Abel, remember that story? Cain, um, he brought his, uh, he, br he brought the uh, fr fruit of his, of his agricultural crops or whatever he had, all right? And Abel brought a lamb from his flock. But here's the difference. Abel brought the firstborn. Immediately he gave the best. It says Cain, it says this, in the process of time, he brought an offering. It means when he got around to do it, he gave an offering, but not the best. Pretty heavy, right? A lot of times people, when they get around to it, they give. But then when they start want to give, there's nothing there because they've already spent it. Here's the lesson. God is looking at our hearts when we give. This is a matter of the heart. A generous heart gives to God, but a hardened heart wants to hold on and try to do it themselves, even though it isn't working. In Leviticus 27, verse 30, it says, The tithe belongs to the Lord. It's holy. When we give our tithe, we're giving something that's holy to the Lord. Father, I just thank you that You've given me a job. Thank you, Lord, that you've given me health. Thank you, Lord, for the home you've given me or whatever shelter I have. Thank you for the vehicle that I drive. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And the list goes on and on. And so we give out of thankfulness to the Lord. Now, if I had 10 $1 bills, and I showed that to you, and I said, this dollar goes to the house payment, this goes to the car payment, this goes for groceries, this goes for some entertainment, and then we get over here to the tenth one, oh yeah, this goes to God. Is that tithing? No. no. Tithe is what our sister says. She writes it out right away. Why? Get rid of the temptation to take it for yourself. And then 
Let, you, let God help you to manage that other 90%. The first portion has the power. Listen to this. The first portion has the power to redeem the rest. Romans eleven sixteen says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So when we tithe, we're bringing life into the other 90%. Now you can't live on 100% 100 and give 10% away. You have to learn to live on the 90%. But God blesses that 90% way more than you could ever anticipate. The first portion carries the blessing. Think about Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Now God gave Abraham some tremendous promises that he would be the father of many nations. But he only had one son. All right? Isaac. And then what does God tell him to do? Sacrifice him. God asked for the firstborn, which was all he had in Genesis 22. What a, tre what a tremendous challenge. God, how are you going to do that? Abraham did not know. But what did he say when he was bringing Isaac up to Mount Moriah? They asked, he said, I and my son are going and we will come back. Somehow he knew that God was going to take care of this. Even if he thrust his knife into his son's chest cavity, God would bring back life to him. All God wanted was, Abraham, do you believe me? Will you give me your firstborn? And what happened? The ram became the redeeming for the son. God will always come through. But when we don't do our part, he can't bless us. Abraham sacrificed Isaac. God asked for a firstborn, which was all he had. If God is first in your life, does your bank transactions or your checkbook reflect it? Ooh, that's tough, Pastor. Ooh. We like to talk a good talk. But when the rubber meets the road, what my checkbook or my bank statement says really tells me what's important to me. Hello? I'm trying to give you something to bless you. And if some of you are struggling with this right now, will you struggle through to the blessing? Because God wants to bless you. I want to hear about testimonies of how good God is and what he's done, just like I heard from these folks. Because I remember some of those days and the struggles. And now to hear this, what a blessing that is. And you see, that when we follow God, we're candidates for blessing. Now when Satan comes against you with fear and says, you're going to go broke, your marriage is going to fail, you're going to get a disease, or you can firmly say these declarations that we passed out to you today. I want you to think about, grab them right now. Think about the first one. It says, key scripture on financial blessings. I'm just going to read two of them, the top ones. Philippians 4.19, Paul's in jail when he says this. Yet he knows that there's a good God out there that will take care of him. And my God will meet your needs, what? According to his riches and glory. Because he owns everything. Boy, you ought to get a little excited over this. This means that God has a great future for you. All right, what is Proverbs 3, 9 and 10? Honor the Lord with your wealth. With the first fruits, that word again, of all your crops, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will brim over with new wine. It isn't the other way around. I honor you. God says, I can trust you now. Sometimes people don't have blessing because God can't trust you because you won't, he can't be trusted with what you got right now. All right, now listen to some of these declarations. These are on scripture. These are truth statements. Pray them. I'm going to do maybe four or five of them this morning. God richly supplies all my financial needs. I honor the Lord with my wealth. My barns are filled to overflow. My vats are brim over with new wine. I give and I receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's poured into my lap. I owe no, I owe no one anything except love. I have set my hope on God who richly provides me with everything to enjoy. Amen. The blessings of the Lord make me rich. It adds no sorrow. And the list goes on and on. I guarantee you, you get these scriptures down in your heart, you obey them, you confess them, you will see the blessings of God begin to flow in your life like you've never been, you've never experienced before. Amen. Now I want to ask you a question. Would you rather try to make it on 100% of your income and be cursed? 
or 90% and be blessed, redeemed, and protected. I'm your pastor here, folks. I'm, I want you to be blessed. But there's no shortcuts. This is a principle from the Old and the New Testament. Statistics are interesting about church giving. Around the world, the church gives 1.8% of their income. Isn't that sad? Well, America, we're a Christian nation. We should be a whole lot better. Well, I hate to tell you this, but we're 1.7%. Imagine what God's people could accomplish if they all gave 10% to God and the other 90% was blessed. God doesn't need you to give you need to be blessed. Do you want to be blessed? Start obeying in this area. And I'll guarantee you we'll have lots of testimonies like this. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given orders for the churches of Galatia. So you must do also on the first day of the week which is what? Sunday. Let each one of you lay up something aside Storing up as he may prosper. One translation says, in relation to what you have earned. You see, it's not equal amount God wants. It's equal effort. 10% of 100 is no different than 10% of a million to God. It's equal effort. First fruits bringing to him. In Exodus chapter 13 that we talked about, we're going to finish with that. In verses 12 and 13, we're going to refer to it. Here God is instructing the Israelites on how to pass down the principle of the firstborn to future generations. When their children asked you why you are sacrificing this firstborn lamb, you are to tell them the story of what it was like to be a slave in Egypt and how God delivered us. This is a sacred covenant that we have made with God to keep him first. That is why we give him the first of all of our increase. Robert Morris is a great teacher on this subject and he often would write out his check because God has given him a gift of giving that's beyond the tithe. And then people, some people have that where a tithe is a slap in the face because they realize God's blessing in their life and they freely give way beyond the tithe. Well, he's one of those guys. But he lets his kids sometimes put the tithe check into, uh, into the offering when they were younger and they would say, Dad... That's a big check. Why do you do that? And then he does the same thing that the Israelite fathers did. Son, I want you to know, Dad wasn't always a Christian. I didn't become a Christian until I was 19, and I was on drugs, and I was wasted. There's a lot of my friends that are dead because they never changed and came to Christ, but I followed Jesus, and he changed my life. I want to be thankful for what he has done. I want to be generous. And I want to let God know that I am so thankful for what he has done in my life. And this is just a token of my appreciation. You'll say, Pastor, we haven't received an offering. Well, there's a reason why we haven't received an offering. Because that's how we're going to close the service today is with an offering. The offering, you may not be prepared today. And you may say, Pastor, I'm struggling with this. Well, I want you to struggle through this, okay? I want you to read those scriptures. I want you to make those declarations. And then I want you to get that next check you have. Say, Lord, I'm going to put, I'm going to give right there. And if you can't give that tenth, make sure you give something and work toward the tenth. Why? Because the tenth, the first part is the blessing. I want you to be blessed. God doesn't need your money, but you need to be blessed. All right, ushers, would you come forward at this time? This is an act of worship. And I want to encourage you to give testimonies of how God has blessed you in this in the future as a response to this message. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of giving. And some folks give online, so Lord, we're thankful for that as well. Oh, Father, I pray that you'll bless gift and giver. I pray, Lord, blessings upon this church, each member. I pray, Father, that we will hear many great reports in the future. So, Lord, we give you this offering as an act of worship in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.
to 